Our world today, we're here for the annual conference for SPUC Scotland. It's a wonderful day, there's about 160 people here. It's a very full conference, uh, very exciting speakers and a, a great buzz about the place. There's a lot, lot of things happening in the pro-life world this year, lots of challenges, but we're up for the challenge and our supporters have shown how much they're willing to support us in taking forward the, the pro-life campaign. So yeah, we're, uh, it's a great day, very excited by what's happening. Wow, it's a beautiful event today, so full, I didn't know when I... I got the invitation to come speak at Spock Scotland. I just imagined there'll be maybe 20 people. <laughs> so it's nice to be speaking to, uh, to all of you and I'm really honored to be among you. Uh, Spock has been a, a, a real family to me. Yeah, well, Uju really, I think what she gives is an international perspective to show that we're fighting it re really, uh, uh, it's been diagnosed as a culture of death, as we're all very familiar with now. But to show the extent to which this ideology is willing to spread itself across the world and how really it's captured the minds of our politicians who show a grim determination to promote these ideas, even though it's devastated our country in terms of the demography, um, the priorities, it's, it's inverted the priorities of health care, it's, um, it, you know, it's damaged women. But they keep wanting to do it and, and they want to invest millions of pounds to do it abroad as well. But here is a public perception of abortion in Africa. Uh, Pew Research 2014, 40,000 respondents in 40 different countries, so including Western countries and Asian countries and uh, Latin American countries and African countries. So went through different countries, 40,000 respondents asking them what they think about abortion as a moral issue. And this was, I just picked out the ones that, that, you know, that was interesting, the African ones. And you can see that in South Africa, 61% of the people that responded to this particular survey said they thought abortion was morally unacceptable. 61%, mind you, abortion is legal in South Africa. So only 10% said that it was acceptable. In Nigeria, my country, 80% of the people said abortion was completely unacceptable. 82% in Kenya, 88% in Uganda, 92% in Ghana. Saying they would, no, we don't want abortion. This is actually why, if you wonder why that red patch in the map I just showed you, that's the main reason. It's not because the African people don't know what abortion is. It's not because people don't even do abortion. But yes, people, there's always, you know, people who go clandestinely and they do all sorts of things. It's not only abortion, there are several things that are done illegally in African countries, but people don't want it to be legal because we have our moral compass and our moral compass, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, our moral compass is in place and we know what is right and what is wrong and it's right and wrong should not be redefined in order for people to give an excuse to, to, to pass a law that, that would kill the unborn. So this is the reason why no government in most of the African countries, no government has the guts to legalize abortion. Uh, only about a month and a half ago, the prime minister of this country, Theresa May, went out to Africa and she made a promise for 200 million pounds extra, in addition to everything the United Kingdom was given, uh, for promotion of family planning and you know all of these things. 77 million of that money is going to a notorious abortion organization called Marie Stopes International. You should stop this from happening. Uh, but that also just shows us that it's getting worse, not better, because the UK government has been giving money to a lot of these causes that are not good uh, in the name of development but then they're increasing the money, they're not reducing it. So we want to see a reduction um, of, of this kind of monies because this is not real development and African people recognize and know it uh, and shouldn't be happening. What we're doing today is we're not necessarily talking about what Project Truth is or what it does. We're going to tackle some of the common questions and statements that people ask us when we're on the street. So uh, we've got different group members that are here and they're willing to share their experience. So as Louise said, um, the main argument on the pro-abortion side is my body, my choice. And uh, guaranteed when you're handing out leaflets and you're like, oh, you know, what's your view on abortion? You're going to get, oh, well, I think the woman has a right to choose over her own body. <laughs> and uh, oh, there's that gem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, what I normally say is, okay, yeah, no, I think a woman does have a right to choose over her own body. But during abortion, is she actually, you know, like what's the effect having 
on her body and does it affect anybody else? So the first thing you've kind of got to establish is the bodily autonomy of the child. Um, so I'd normally say, okay, yep, yeah, her body, her choice, and what, what's the choice, what is it that she's making, like she's choosing to do? Oh, well, I think she's choosing to terminate the pregnancy. Okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. And uh, what's involved in the pregnancy? Oh, well, you know, it's her body. Uh, and you're like, yeah, so, so it's an unborn child. And um, they'll say, well, no, I don't think it's an unborn child until it's born or until it's viable or able to live outside the womb without its mother. And um, in those circumstances, you kind of got to think, well, no one can really live without an adult feeding them for the first few years of their born life. Um, so, you know, at what point does it become a human? And at what point is it, you know, not good to have an abortion? And they'll say birth. Is it okay to kill a child five minutes before birth, five minutes after birth? And they'll be like, oh no, that's ridiculous. And you're kind of bringing the real world. Did you know that it's okay in Scotland to kill a child up to birth for disability? And that includes a cleft palate. And they'll, that most people are absolutely horrified. They don't know that that's actually a law that's been passed. Um, it's, it's very exciting and inspiring to be here today. It, it's a, a chance for us all to be encouraged in our pro-life position and to learn a little bit more about different, from different people in the pro-life movement and to gather together as a group. And I think sometimes it's hard. You can feel like there's very few people in the pro-life movement, but if you look at everyone here today, you realise that actually we're not as small as you think. Well, on the road, Chancellor, you said one main question we got was, you don't have a right to speak about this. We had, um, on the very first day, a woman with a young child approach us and say, can I just ask, do any of you have kids? And I said, yeah, I do. And I'm very open to say, and he was born in an unplanned pregnancy. I'm not ashamed of it. What I would, um, I'm actually proud of it. I'm proud that he was born. I think this, in these situations, makes people think, okay, I'm going to engage with you because you've had that experience and most of the time it's, don't say it until you're in my shoes. Well, I've, I was in shoes similar to yours and well, do you know what, I've done all right for myself. Well, wasn't it a wonderful conference? I mean, it's so difficult to choose what was the most exciting or hopeful uh, talk. I mean, obviously the Project Truth, the articulacy of the, of the young people, the incredible arguments and poise of those young people and the way they're being trained by Spuck Scotland and, and the, the collaboration uh, getting out onto the street. And then we've also got uh, Fia Ellen Nash speaking. Now she's done a lot of study and research to show that the biggest victims of abortion in the world are women. Um, this is my latest book and I'm putting forward the case that real feminism is pro-life feminism. Um, that Real feminism is about protecting the innocent, about protecting the vulnerable, equal rights, and therefore all feminists should oppose abortion and should seek to protect the innocent. So I would mention the word abortion to men that were walking down the street, and they would kind of tap and they would say, no son, that's not for me to say, that's not for you to say, and they would just kind of continue along the way, and most men actually refused to stop and talk to me about it. So the result of that was most of my conversations were, were with young women, and where that while I can understand it to an extent from women, I, I couldn't help but feeling it's, it's a bit of a cop-out if you're a man. So you're just precluding yourself from taking any responsibility whatsoever for what is a really important moral issue. So what about rape? Um, and it is a really difficult one and I did draw the short straw by doing this uh, talk today. Everyone was like, yeah, Grace really wants to do this one. Um, so that's why I'm here. Um, but... Uh, I kind of developed a tactic, I suppose you could say, um, when people would ask me about this and I found it was quite useful. Um, so basically it was on the second day and I was speaking to a guy and he was like quite well educated on the issue and whatnot. Um, and, and so we were talking um, and he was giving me loads of different scenarios and stuff. And then he was like, but listen, like you, you can't um, force a woman who's been raped to have a baby. Like that's terrible. Um, and I said to him, I was like, well, you've just met me today you don't know my name, you don't know anything about me, where I'm from, but you can look at me today and I can say that I'm part of like a great family, I've got great friends, I'm at a university doing a course that I love, um, and I would consider myself a successful person, but you have no idea how I was brought into this world. 
would that make you think less of me if I told you that I I was um, like the product of rape? And and he didn't say anything. And I kind of waited, and he was like, but but um, and and he didn't know what to say. And I was like, I've got you there. Um, and from that point on, his body language changed, and he actually was so much more open to chatting. And that was then what I went with. So I was saying to people, why are we going to be in a position to actually judge a person on the way that they were brought into this world? It, interestingly, like, I feel some people that are pro-abortion almost think that pro-lifers in, in some way don't care that women are raped or it doesn't affect them. And that's what I was saying to people. I was like, it absolutely does. Like, I think that's absolutely terrible. And Emma and Louise like, said a good thing to us, which I said to loads of people um, throughout the week, was that um, rape is a terrible violence against an innocent human being and that's why I hate it but then similarly abortion is a terribly violent crime against an innocent human being and that's why I hate abortion but we also wanted to show the, the very foundation of what our fight is about and that's about recognizing the dignity of every single human life and that's why we have Dr John Wyatt speaking he treats um, babies uh, neonates who are born very early so so babies born at 22 weeks of, of pregnancy so I think when uh, when people hear him and hear about the care and attention and how special every single life is, I think that they're, they're really touched by that. Progressively, uh, year on year, there is a continued improvement in survival. These are uh, published figures showing the increases in survival uh, between 95 and 2006. These represent uh, surveys done of all the babies born in England and Wales, and showing, if you take 23 weeks, for instance, an increase from 11% to 20%, 24 weeks from 26% to 38%. This is an average figure across all the baby units in the UK, and you wouldn't be surprised to find that some units that very that have very specialised staff and equipment, the survival is much better than in a district general hospital, for instance, which may not have the same kind of specialist staff. So, uh, in my own unit at UCH, the survival now for babies at 23 weeks is over 50% in general. And uh, many other uh, specialist intensive care units have the same kind of experience. It's a proven fact that the baby is from conception. It's a human being. And it's wonderful that we've got ultrasound scans and the 3D scans and everything to let any layperson see that on a scan. And there's nothing nicer, especially the first trimester when we gets our first scan. That's the, she, finds, she sees the baby jumping about on the skin, arms and legs, eyes, yawning, moving around. Um, nobody can deny the humanity of the unborn child. So this is a picture I often use when teaching medical students. I have the privilege still of teaching medical students and junior doctors at ethics. And uh, I would show this picture and I'd say, this is what you look like, top left, when you were born. This is what you look like at 28 weeks, top middle. Top right, this is what you look like at 18 weeks. Bottom left, this is what you look like at six weeks. This is what you look like at three weeks. Bottom right, this is what you look like at three days. As you go back in your own personal history, is there any point at which you can say, that is not me? And I don't think there is. I think however far you go back, all the way to the early embryo, that is me. That is the person. I am the same person. And therefore, I just think that's a helpful way of helping people think. If you make it personal and you say, that's actually what you look like. And if someone had destroyed you, you wouldn't be here. So the, there is a continuity, a way of tracing the, our story all the way back to the very beginning. And of course, what the Christian faith also says is that God saw you and knew you. God was involved with you even before your parents knew you existed. You were there. It, you know, every baby has a photo album. And uh, when I started as a junior doctor, the photo album usually started with a Polaroid picture taken after birth and of, of dad. Uh, holding the baby. In fact, we've got three boys and we've got three Polaroid pictures with Dad looking distinctly grey and dishevelled 
having been up all night, just, and mum was in an even worse state, of course, and uh, uh, looking after the, uh, just cuddling this wonderful baby. It's a very nostalgic picture. But these days, of course, every baby's photo album starts with a grainy ultrasound picture. And I think that's very, very significant, because what the ultrasound picture is saying is exactly the same thing. That's you. That's what you look like. That's when we first saw you. That's when we met you. So ultrasound is actually telling the same message. Amazing number of people, I mean 150. I was thinking about that. There's, what's this, five million people live in Scotland? In America, uh, there'd be sort of 350 million. I mean, the equivalent number in America would be 70 times 150. It'd be about be the most amazing number of people that have come to this conference. It's, it's, it's great.